Once upon a time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Your destination for imagination. A big warm welcome to everyone and a huge thank you for joining us once again for the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission is to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature spanning a whole range of genres to book lovers all around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I am Darren Kazanko, science fiction and horror author, reader of course, and one of your hosts and co-founder of the Australian Book Lovers website and podcast, and I'm coming to you today from Corner Country. And I am Veronica Strachan, aka V.E. Patton, fantasy, memoir and picture book writer, reader, and your other co-founder and host for today. Yes, episode number 34. Yeah, it's kind of getting up there, isn't it? It is indeed. I, I'm, I'm, I'm exciting to hit the 50. That, that's, I think, the real big goal then. I yeah, feel like, wow. Just skip on over. Yes, definitely. I mean, but it's hours and hours. I'll have to add up how many hours it is. But yeah, lots and lots of fabulous content for readers and writers. Oh, absolutely. We've already had so many fantastic interviews. And I know for a fact, we've still got a whole lot more coming too. So, definitely. Yeah. So, no, 34. Um, look. What a proud moment is just you know it's just a number that uh, feels to me serious as in uh, it's not just a flash in the pan now 34 is kind of like definitely adult territory and uh, you know here for the long haul so i like it number 34 very happy to be here so thank you everyone for joining us for number 34. absolutely and thank the 2367 people who have downloaded an episode Absolutely. Woo-hoo. That's a lot of people. <laughs> That's a lot of people on downloads. Well, actually, it's perhaps not that many people, but it's that many downloads because we have lots of regulars. Certainly on Twitter, they say, oh, another episode, can't wait. It's going to be great for their uh, commute or, you know, people have got time off and they want to listen to it quietly there. So, yeah, lots of regulars, which is fantastic. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if my voice makes a uh, peak hour commute better or worse. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, well, but, perhaps not but thank you for listening. <laughs> it's the thing. But I have been listening to a number of other podcasts of late on my uh, walk around the block and down the street and all those kind of things. And listening to Joanna Penn, um, a couple of hers in particular, podcasts sell books. It's really interesting that she has had uh, and of course you know she's up to episode 500 and something or other so she's oh. been doing a podcast for a long time that's, a, that's uh, awesome yes yeah she is amazing and so generous with her time and she writes um a thrillers as well as um non-fiction books but she it's yeah really clear evidence that if people can get on podcasts then generally they sell more books so that's good well, I, I'm, look, you know, I think when you're reading a book, it's obviously that's the goal is to read a really awesome book, and you you might hunt out that same author, of, you know, to see what other titles he or she has written mm. uh, available. Mm. But podcast is great fun because you get to hear, you know authors f- tell their own stories you know the reason they're writing and you can you know with over a quick little hour or two sometimes even a little bit more uh, you can yes. you know th- it's it's just a fantastic way of hearing w- other things that are out there and yeah. you know expanding yeah. that sort of awareness of what might be available so which you don't always get you know from reading a book by itself or maybe you know and websites can be overwhelming there can be you know obviously there's there is just literally thousands of new artistic uh, options around every second on the internet but yes <laughs> uh, but so I think it's fun and it's a little nice and intimate to you know have a chat and, and hear an author talk about their book and uh, it makes it easy if, if they're talking about a style or a genre that might be interesting to a listener out there then it makes it a little bit easier for them to consider maybe hunting that book down or that author yeah. down yeah, for sure. And of course, you're supporting Australian artists, which is the best part uh, in the world. Which is really important. They, yeah, artists really need your support after these really difficult couple of years. Yes, and uh, hopefully the worst is behind us. So fingers crossed. But episode number 34, how about we jump to some news? Sounds good.
And so episode 34 news time, I thought I'd do something a little bit different because it is October and you know, as I move through this life, I'm starting to think maybe I enjoy October more than December because it is obviously Halloween month for all ah. things spooky ooky. <laughs> and uh, yeah. you know, there's I don't have to hear the Christmas uh, repeat CDs walking around uh, any shops or anything. <laughs> and it's not perfect, yet. As not soon yet. as Halloween's over, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, come. I know. So I thought uh, for all our writers out there, um, I just thought I'd let you know about a flash fiction and short story story competition mm -hmm. uh, that is being hosted by Australasian Horror or the website AustralasianHorror.com. Now it, it did actually, the submissions were opened in July 30 of this year, but they applications don't close until October 31st of uh, mm -hmm. 2021. So it is the 2021 AHWA Robert N. Stevenson Flash Fiction and Short Story Competition. And basically they have said on their website that we want your best horror story, your very best. This is Australia's leading unpublished horror fiction competition and our winning entries are always imaginative, engaging, well-written and bloody scary. We need <laughs> tales that frighten, yarns that unsettle us in our comfortable homes. All themes in horror will be accepted from the supernatural classics, for example, zombies, vampires and ghosts, to psychological roller coaster rides, to the highly original. No previously published entries, sorry, no previously published entries will be accepted though. All tales have to be original work by the author. Now there are two categories for the submission. One is the flash, sorry, the flash fiction submission, and that's for mm. stories up to 1000 words in length. And then of course there is the short story submission category, which is stories from 1001 words to 7,500 words. The winner in each of the categories will receive an engraved plaque and the winning stories will appear in Midnight Echo and receive the pay rate commensurate with that edition. Now, entry details. So writers who are Australian, Australia, New Zealand, sorry, Australasian, uh, so including Australia, New Zealand, etc., citizens may submit one or to one or both categories, but entry is limited to one story per author per category. So no simultaneous submissions. Any questions, of course, please don't hesitate to contact them. And please submit stories individually. For example, one email for each category you're entering with the subject line AHWA short or AHWA flash and the title of your story. So you'll find more instructions on the website, which is australasianhorror.com. And then you can even do backslash competition. Uh, but yeah, so they are, again, flash fiction up to 1000 words, short story, 1001 to 7,500 words. Entries closed 30th, sorry, 31st of October. So there's still time to put together some flash fiction or even mm. a short story. And um, now as far as the judging panel for 2021, it will be David Stevens, Pete Kempshaw, Marty Young, Bernie Rutkay, Ronnie Smart and Claire Fitzpatrick. Now, uh, the final thing I'll let you know is the fees for the general public. The fee is $5 for a flash fiction or $10 for short story entries. If you are a AHWA member, of course, the entry is free. So once again, that is the, uh, you can visit australasianhorror.com and find out all about that competition, uh, which is basically the Robert N. Stevenson flash fiction and short story competition, specifically for October Halloween. So get writing, do something spooky ooky, put a chill down somebody's spine and get those uh, submissions in there and you gotta be in it to win it. You do, you do. It's interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, how Halloween has seeped into the uh, Australian culture, I guess, you know, being, uh, I think, primarily um, in the US from, from what I thought. So, although I don't know, where, is, do they celebrate that in, in the UK and parts of Europe and that as well? Well, look, to be honest, I'm not too sure. I mean, I've, I've traditionally I've thought of it as you know, predominantly an American a holiday or, or a celebration. But, you know, someone mentioned that the other day that they don't like Halloween because it's American. I'm thinking, and it got me thinking to the point where, well, actually, you know, the Christmas isn't Australian. We've inherited that. And mm. that was probably inherited from, you know, uh, older traditions, obviously. Or my, you know, Christmas is really is, is a kind of an amalgamation of a number of different celebrations i mm, mean mm. when you think about it it has the religious aspects but then it has that sort of strange pine tree um rebirth you know all that sort of stuff in it as mm. well that you could go to i guess 
um, I don't know what you'd call it, but you know, those, those sort of Gaelic, is it, or even Druids and all the way back in time. Mm. Uh, and so, and I think celebration of things scary isn't exact, isn't, you know, cornerstone of America. I mean, we've got Day of the Dead in, in South America, in Mexico. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's one of those celebrations that has just trickled down through throughout time and yeah it's probably we should have got an expert on a halloween expert on yeah well worry. <laughs> we still well we'll de definitely uh be doing some research into it for but maybe the next episode which will be closer yes. come out closer to halloween itself uh but yeah i think it's uh you know just one of those look america probably capitalized on it like, like, they, <laughs> like they do so well on, in so many avenues um uh, but look it's it's fun um uh, it's a uh, it's fun to see people sort of embracing scary stuff and 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 making it a bit of fun, uh, mm, you know. Mm. And maybe something I don't know. Maybe something primal within us all that likes to get dressed up and put fake blood all over ourselves. And <laughs> yeah, that could just be you, though, Darren. <laughs> well, it could be me. So, you know, hand on heart, I've never dressed up for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, we never had Halloween when and I was a kid. But and yes, okay, that was a while back. But also out here in regional Victoria, where I am. We don't get kids dropping in. It's too far between houses for a start and it would take them, you know, an hour and a half to get half a dozen houses. So probably not a lot of, you know, booty to collect. I think there's more now in the suburbs around Melbourne. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's there's pockets of it, I mm -hmm. guess, it's, and it's gradually getting a little bit more of a following. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, before we... Obviously, this isn't a horror episode, but uh, <laughs> just while we're in the month of October, which, as I mentioned, is, is quickly becoming my favourite month, one thing that really uh, that I find really cool about Halloween in this, when you do see you know people trick or treating and all that um, is it's a holiday yeah it's a scary and there's monsters but isn't it funny that it actually really has a community spirit about it because suddenly you've got people visiting their neighbours and uh, you know sharing a smile sharing a laugh candy you know it's um, people walking around the streets there's there's that feeling of you know things are safe and it's a you know each community has its own little trick or treat areas and uh, i think that's cool it's a you know so really it's a it's a strange community celebration that just happens to be wrapped up in candy and blood mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that's a theory work in progress <laughs> yeah i think i'll leave that one as a work in progress oh, dear. well i do have actually a news article that i wanted to share but i'm thinking i might say actually i'm going to save that one save for that? the next All podcast right. closer to halloween so on Excellent. that note uh, so yes uh, just quickly for our authors out there that are looking to do a, a little bit of spooky ooky competition that was the uh, robert n stevenson flash fiction and short story competition find it at australasianhorror.com sounds good and speaking of slightly spooky stories, sorry, have you finished your news? I have indeed, yes. I'm going to save the other, one, other part, yeah. <laughs> All right. I've got a few quick things to share with the readers. And one was that I was absolutely delighted to be asked to um, host um, the book launch for one of our author's latest novels. So EJ Dawson, who loves Halloween, if you follow her on social media, you'll see she's right into Halloween. So should have got her as an expert. I'm sure she could have told us all about it. Or well, maybe there's something we can still do. Who knows? Yes. I have to see if she can give us a quick 10 minutes uh, on uh, the history of Halloween. So EJ has just released a book, Behind the Veil. Uh, Literary Wanderlust is the, the publisher, is an independent publisher in the US, and they picked up her gothic noir. So I'm going to read just a little of the, the blurb, which is fantastic. It was so good to have EJ talk about where the book came from and her. Yeah, we have already interviewed her on Australian Book Lovers, but it was lovely to hear a little bit more about this book in particular. So Behind the Veil... Can she keep the secrets of her past to rescue a girl tormented by a ghost? In 1920s Los Angeles, Letitia Hawking reads the veil between life and death, which is, this isn't a part of the verb, which is very much where Halloween is about, isn't it? It's the day when it's thinnest between worlds or something or other. So there you go. Back to the blurb. A scrying ball allows her to experience the final moments of the deceased. She brings closure to grief-stricken war widows and mourning families. For Letitia, it is a penance. She knows no such peace. For Alastair Driscoll, it may be the only way to save his niece, Fanola, from her growing night terrors. 
But when Letitia sees a shadowy figure attached to the household, it rouses old fears of her unspeakable past in England. When a man comes to her about his missing daughter, the third girl to go missing in as many months, Letitia can't help him when she can't see who's taken them. As darkness haunts Letitia's vision, she may not be given a choice in helping the determined Mr. Driscoll or stopping herself falling in love with him. But to do so risks a part of herself she locked away, and to release it may cost Letitia her sanity and her heart. Two so very important go. things that, that uh, you, you don't want to lose in a hurry. No, no, but it, it was lovely. And she's already got, you know, ratings on um, Goodreads and Amazon and all that kind of thing. So a great book. I have read it. I haven't put my review up there, but she will be getting five stars from me. It is really lovely, really good. In yeah. fact, I will record my review for that and we'll uh, pop it on to the end of an episode very soon. Yes. Yeah, and look, and a huge congratulations to EJ um, hmm. and, and for a, a wonderful book launch, the online book launch. That was great. Uh, yeah. It was f really fun being a part of that. And uh, like I said, just to uh, be able to sit down and, and listen to her talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the ins and outs of her motivations and what, what drew, you know, the, this new book together. So it was great. And uh, I'm definitely going to be hunting down a signed copy. That's for sure. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, just another quick mention of one of our authors has, another one of our authors has a new book out, Lynn uh, Webster, so L.A. Webster, she writes, has uh, her book Scalsinger is the second in her uh, The Chronicles of Algarth and she's uh, just uh, sent out our copies, advanced reader copies, and I am just about a third of the way through that and loving it. So, uh, yeah, can't wait to be able to share that with you. Um, yes, young widow with a musical gift that's truly magical, a desperate search for her husband's missing twin, and a conflict that will threaten her homeland and her soul. So there you go. So I'm right into that at the moment which is lovely. Conflict, music, I'm in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she got a, this, the Scale Singer is a really interesting gift that she's uh, got. So yeah, that is amazing. But back to some news. There's one uh, in internship that I just wanted to mention uh, that's being uh, run, Open Book it's called. It's an internship pilot program that's going to run in 2022. And it's a paid internship aiming to increase cultural diversity in the Australian publishing workforce. And it was delayed, of course, due to COVID as so many things were, but they've got one, two six-month paid placements. One's in New South Wales and the other's in Victoria. And the interns get an introduction to the industry at a rotating selection of publishing houses across commercial, independent and educational presses. So you've got Payne Macmillan, uh, Hachette, uh, University of New South Wales Press in Sydney, Hardy Grant, Oxford University Press and Scribe in Melbourne. So one is for an identified Aboriginal person and the other is for and uh, Torres Strait Islander role. So it's fantastic that there is a, you know, gradually a little bit more serious work to bring those other voices, bring, you know, uh, black, indigenous, people of colour voices and to let them get into our still primarily middle-aged white guy publishing, even though we talk to lots of different women and that they will say uh, often that the, the upper echelons of publishing are still um, primarily, yeah, the, the um, white. So there you go. Hmm, interesting. Nice one. Nice one, nice one. And we quite, are we moving on to talk about Hayley? Because I'd love to talk about I Hayley. I think Walsh. absolutely. <laughs> we need to let our guests know, our, guests, our listeners our, know our listeners of our are, yeah. super duper awesome guest that's on today's yeah. uh, episode. And uh, you had the amazing luck of being able to interview none other than Hayley Walsh. Yes, and Hayley was a scream. She is just so lovely. She's a very funny lady. She's got a, a wicked sense of humour. I think you could say that. Uh, she writes light-hearted fiction, uh, born and bred in Sydney, where she lives with her, her partner and two stepsons uh, up there in Sydney's western suburbs. Loves animals. She's a coffee addict. And she's also a nurse. So she works in aged care. And we had a lot of fun chatting both bits that we recorded and bits that we didn't <laughs> about nursing and uh, all those kind of things and writing and how to do all of that. So understandably, as you can imagine, uh, the New South Wales health system has been under uh, some pressure and Hayley has been right in the thick of that. So it, yeah, it, it's fantastic. But 
as well as Making March, uh, which was a book of her that I'd read and that we, we talked about, Haley's actually gone on to write um, so many other things as well. So she has a number of books uh, that she's got. And let me just tell you all the books she has got now, Crayons and Chaos as well, What Happened to My Life, which is where it's kind of a little bit... Um, based on her own life, semi-autobiographical, I'll just say, where a, a young mum, a young woman inherits, you know, two stepsons, which is what happened to Hayley. She's also written, write that book, uh, Helpful Ramblings of a Self-Published Author. And coming up very soon, she's got one that I think I would really appreciate, which is called Not Dead Yet. Oh, uh, that's a <laughs> She cool talks title. about that a little bit, yes. It's basically, can Mary learn to get on with her life now? She's a widow, so... Um, after some convincing by her family, Mary decides to sell her home in Sydney, move to a retirement village in Queensland. And, you know, some of the hilarious things that, that go on when that happens, which is uh, fantastic. So having looked at all of that and talked about lighthearted fiction, I did some research, really, I guess, and went down to kind of a, a Google rabbit hole for why is it so important that we have not only the the deep literary significant, courageous, all those other, <clears throat> excuse me, philosophical works, but also that we have lighthearted fiction, you know, amusing and entertaining and cheerful and carefree. I feel like we need way more of that, given what everyone has been putting well, up with yeah, this no last time like of years. the present to maybe inject a little bit of uh, ent like good old fashioned entertainment, which is really what lighthearted is, I yes. think, is, is entertainment that makes you feel good. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, and I mean, have you ever heard of a conversation about, say, for example, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where oh. people are angry? <laughs> Not normally. No. <laughs> so. no, in fact, when I was thinking about the quotes for today, that was some of them, you know, so long and thanks for all the fish. Yes, I, I love Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That kind of dry sense of humour is very funny. And I thought I would share with our listeners some of the benefits of laughter. So if you've been reading a lot of serious stuff, maybe think about picking up something a little lighter because laughter relaxes the whole body. A good hearty laugh will relieve the physical tension and stress, leaving your muscles relaxed for up to 45 minutes. So oh, wow. that's pretty good. So that's more than going to the gym, Darren. I'm just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I can't say I've, I've, there's, I'll get, I uh, find myself laughing much in the gym. No, or, or even I not relaxing much. I was angry the other day. Yeah, <laughs> oh, only because I hadn't been for a while and then oh, I went back go. and I realised I'm so weak. <laughs> <laughs> it just only took a couple of weeks of disappearing. Oh, there you go. Laughter also boosts your immune system. Uh, it triggers the release of endorphins. Laughter protects the heart. It, it you know, improves the function of blood vessels and increases the blood flow. It burns calories. Uh-huh. Didn't mm. know that then. And while it's no replacement for going to the gym, this study says, <laughs> uh, but one study found that if you laugh for 10 to 15 minutes a day, you can burn about 40 calories, well, which allow you to lose three or four pounds over the course of a year. So maybe, you know, don't use it as, as, your, <laughs> yeah. as your weight loss program. But here you go. Laughter lightens anger's heavy load. There you go. Yeah. And, and laughter may even help you live longer. Well, I, I would like to believe that. And I, I think I can believe that. And, do you know, it's, um, yeah, especially as you mentioned, you know, with the way that state of things at the moment, uh, laughter can be something that is uh, a moment in time that's few and far between. And on the occasion that I have had a good belly laugh, it kind of strikes me as, oh my God, I haven't laughed like that in so long. Yeah. Um, and so it, and, and it just feels good to laugh, doesn't it? So It does, and, it does. And, or even just to have a smirk to yourself. You know, like if you're reading something that puts a smile on your face, that um, lightens the load too. That really just makes, uh, it puts a completely different atmosphere to the to the world around you. Yeah. If, if, you've, if you're smirking and having a bit of a giggle inside. That's it. And Haley's books definitely will make you smirk and giggle. I think uh, I had a couple of nearly spit my cups of tea out. No, okay. <laughs> that's, that's always reading, good. Making March. So, yeah, it uh, definitely good fun. Now, I have got six tips for bringing more laughter into your life, if you'd like me to uh, share those with you. Oh, I think I definitely want you to share those. <laughs> okay. Number one, don't worry about being funny. So, you know, don't... Uh, 
think that you have to be comedian-like funny. So humor is not a talent, it's a habit, uh, which is quite funny. You know, if stuff gets spilt on the table, laugh about it, whoever you're with. So rather than getting serious, just, you know, let all your day be funny. Number two, and this is really relevant, I think, for us at the moment, is to curate your comedy collection. So doom scrolling, which is, you know, what I have to stop myself doing, which is the the tendency to consume endless negative news, which is, you know, such the habit that so many of us have got. Um, What they suggest is that if you're going to go on social media, follow and like as many pages or people that make you laugh. And that way, humour will show up more often in your feeds rather than you know, the other stuff. And, you know, uh, there's a thing called a laughable app and you can sign up and that can be alerted when your favourite funny people are guests on podcasts or when they release a new episode. So that's a, that's a good thing. Or you can look up Cat Thug Life. Yeah. What is it, Cat like. What? Cat Thug Life. Oh. And it's, it's using snippets of cats being very naughty <laughs> and being proud of it. <laughs> oh, there you go. I must admit that I was so over doom scrolling at one. I said, right, I'm looking up some cat videos and, you know, cats interrupting Zoom calls, Zoom meetings. And I was just laughing myself. Still, I had tears rolling down my cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> no. so funny. Cats, cats bring a bit of a balance back to the world. Yeah, they do. The funny well, ones do anyway. <laughs> number three, take a laugh break. So set an alarm on your phone for a laugh break and then, you know, start with five minutes and watch something funny. Exactly as we've said. Number four is to try the three funny things exercise. So I think you've probably heard me talk about gratitude journals and those kind of things. And you write down at the end of the day, uh, you know, I write down five things, overachiever what, um, five things that I'm grateful for that made me happy. And what they're suggesting is you could do that as a humor journal. You know, what are three things that really made you smile or laugh for the day? So that's, that's a good thing to do as well. Number five, tap laughter to learn more. So humor can be fostered by learning that emotional connection that strengthens memory and therefore can help you understand and retain information. So this is good. So laughter helps repair the damage and makes it easier for you to form new memories. So if you want to, if you've got something that you need to learn or remember, go into it having had a laugh with some more endorphins, with a bit more cortisol, and they're suggesting that that might help you learn better. So that's mm. pretty good. And the last one is don't be afraid to lighten up. So that's I thought, a big oh, one. That, that is a big one. But I did read, not in this article, but in another article, where a woman had decided that she did need to lighten up. So what she did was bought herself a little $2 plastic tiara and she would wear it around the house until, you know, she just would la- catch herself in the mirror and laugh at herself. And then she was able to leave that on her desk so that if she had to be in a meeting where she wasn't, you know, couldn't get away with wearing her tiara, it would just make her smile and that you know, adjust gradually a few different funny bits to be silly um, uh, made her laugh. And I thought, oh, that's a really good idea. Yeah. And isn't it, that that's a, brings up a point too. It's being able to laugh at yourself. Yeah. You know, be, be able to, yeah, just laugh at your own silliness or, you know. But it, uh, what's funny is if you really want to get a uh, laughter out of other people, uh, don't necessarily have to be a comedian or good comedy. If you hurt yourself, that tends to uh, bring out the laughter for some uh-huh. bizarre reason. Well, as human beings, like if I if I see my friend hurt himself, like not badly, but you know what I mean. Mm. Um, it usually uh, hilarity <laughs> it becomes very funny and possibly it, even funny as you as you retell what happens later. Yes, and, and yeah, embroider and uh, elaborate. <laughs> elaborate yeah, that's on. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but no, being after uh, being able to laugh at yourself is very important. But yeah, lightening up. I think that. Oh man, I've got to remind myself of that so often. Yes. Uh, uh, because you know yeah. it's easy like you said you do a bit of doom scrolling you know and um it, it's it's so crazy you can be you find yourself in a real beautiful moment in time and yet you just feel like you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders yeah and you've got to lighten up yes uh, yeah you know, even if it's just for a couple of moments so yeah. thankfully we've got people like Haley walsh who i'm starting to think now maybe he, we can call her our official giggle dealer yeah <laughs> Yes. Absolutely. And <laughs> have you got must... those giggles? Yeah, I got some good giggles this yeah, time. Yeah, she has got Ooh. some good giggles, and now she's got you know not dead yet. I think that's going to be a, another hilarious addition to her literary repertoire. 
And of course, since we've interviewed Hayley, she's actually begun her own podcast. So she is the host of the Right Words podcast, right as in W-R-I-T-E, where she interviews uh, writers and friends and talks about uh, writing and book blogging and uh, book clubs and all those kind of things. So it is definitely worth having a listen to and you can find her on the usual podcast channels as well. That is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So a beacon of joy is uh, lighting up new pathways. Indeed. A, be- a beacon of giggles, shall we yes. say. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that, there's a good idea. We need to have a lighthouse that alerts people where giggles can be found. That would be good. Yeah. I'm just trying to imagine how I built that. But anyway, that's a ve- <laughs> very, very abstract thought there. But, but, but uh, then, do you remember seeing Monsters, Inc.? Did you watch that animated movie? Oh, I didn't see it, to be honest. Okay, so Monsters, Inc. is the uh, basic premise is the scary thing under your bed or in the wardrobe is, in fact, a monster. And they're collecting your screams because your screams or kids' screams power their world. Ah. And long story short, they discover, in fact, that laughter powers it. 10 times more so there you go oh that's cool yeah yeah it was it was good fun and was of course it? it had billy crystal as you know mike Mikow- mike ah. Mikowski, which you know i do love billy crystal he just delivers that humor in such a flat uh tone but it's just yeah i like it it's very well that's funny. it's funny then because in in a way i've uh, managed to incorporate both themes today that is the halloween theme and the happiness theme or having a good laugh <laughs> yes. because i just recently purchased probably for yeah probably spent a little bit too much but i got a very rare vhs uh, horror comedy called wacko from 1982 right uh, and it is it's about a pumpkin headed lawnmower killer and <laughs> it's uh, but it, it is very un pc so it would never be made today not right. on not on your life but uh, it, it never made it to DVD, which is what makes it very rare. Uh, the distrib- <laughs> distribution company went uh, did a shonky for the director, but anyway, so so happy to get it. But uh, it is absolutely a film that I watch many uh, over and over again. But it's one of those films that gets funnier and funnier every time you see it, and oh. uh, so I, I can just think of scenes and, and quietly giggle to myself. So yeah, yeah. you know, a horror movie that actually gives me a bit of a giggle. That's uh, Perfect, uh, perfect thing for a perfect combination. Well, yeah. I have to admit, well, even though I was researching lighthearted fiction and humour and those kind of things, if you look at the internet searches that I was doing for my writing, my own writing, I've got land-based Australian monsters, uh, history of the Yowie, uh, ten legendary monsters of Australasia and Antarctica, um, and you know the. <laughs> The, what is a cryptid anyway so i did have some monsters in my researching today i'm just going to close those i'd forgotten they were open so there you go <laughs> the road to giggles is very strange but it'll get you there <laughs> but yes yeah, so, well i mean that's it's, it's so great to see even just knowing that we're going to about to listen to an interview with Haley walsh is uh i already feel lighter we're already having yeah. a little bit more fun so that's and that's what it's all about so And something tells me that anybody diving into her books are going to be able to enjoy lots of giggles and uh, enjoy a a lighter, what's the word? A lightness of being. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So, well, shall we jump to the uh, awesome interview then? Let's go. Okay. Well, here we are. The giggle dealer, the uh, wonderful word, smile, uh, bringer uh, (laughs) upper person. No, they're absolutely spectacular, Hayley Walsh. Without further ado, here she is. Okay, and welcome Australian book lovers to another fabulous author interview. I have got with me Hayley Walsh. Hayley, welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Hello, Veronica. It is, it's so exciting to finally speak to you. Thank you so much for having me. It, I feel like I know you, and I know that sounds a little crazy, but, you know, you see people on Twitter and there's a bit of, you know, chat back and forth and you read somebody's book and you go, oh, yeah, sure, if I met somebody, Hayley, down the street that I would know, uh, you know, we could have a conversation. Absolutely. And I think particularly as your book, Making March, which I have read, felt as though you'd been at the bottom of my memories and, you know, picked a few treasures out and (laughs) put them on the page. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's very cheeky, isn't it? Very cheeky indeed. 
It, it is absolutely. So let's begin. Uh, Haley is an author of lighthearted fiction, and I think that's a fantastic label to have. What made you choose that kind of writing? Look, I, I have got a wicked sense of humour. I've always had a good sense of humour. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I make a good nurse. I think we have to have a very good sense of humour to Absolutely. do what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And look, I think I think in, in life we just need to laugh. So I just wanted to make people laugh and make people happy. So that's why I chose the genre. Definitely. Mm. Sounds fantastic. Um, do you think that the literary world takes itself a bit too seriously? Definitely. Yeah, Ab absolutely. Absolutely. And and just the experience of queering, um, you know, has made me realise that. So I think, look, if I can just get my work out there and, and give people a giggle on the bus on the way to work, then I've, yep. I've done my job as far as yes. I'm concerned. Definitely. I had a few uh, laugh out loud moments where I nearly, you know, sprayed my cup of tea all over the place. So luckily I wasn't on, on a bus. <laughs> there were some classic moments in making my, I, I'm just going to, you know, quote you on the, the cabbage soup and, and leave people no spoilers. But I remember <laughs> the diet, it was dreadful. <sighs> all right. I'm going to read people the, the blurb from making March. And sure. this is making March. Kate feels old, alone, and regrettably round. It's the 1st of February, and today happens to be her 40th birthday. This month, she must survive a pending divorce, raising her offspring spawn from Satan, being maid of honour, a fellow bridesmaid from hell, multiple dress fittings, and her meddling mother. Can she make it to March without losing her marbles? <laughs> what, what's the inspiration behind all of that? Look, to be honest, it's a little bit of, of real life. Um, mm. A lot of the character is based on myself, um, uh -huh. as well as people I know, um, people I've met during my career. So yep. lots of interesting characters that I've met throughout my life. Mm. Obviously, a lot of it is poetic justice. A lot of it is made up. <laughs> I did but... notice that you had on your Instagram one of those fabulous cups, which was, you know, please don't annoy the writer. She might put you in a book and kill you. So this is is retribution, you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so all those bad dates I had before I met my ex-husband and my now partner, uh -huh. um, I'll just leave you wondering whether they're actually in the book. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so some of them, oh yeah, some very bad experiences came um, to fruition in the book, I think. So there yeah, so and they were good for a laugh. Yes. Names and dates have been, uh, you know, changed to protect the innocent, as they say. Of course. Um, uh, Sandy Barker, who we chatted to on recently on the romance panel, said she feels like anything silly that her friends and family do is fair game and they know it. So they're likely to end up in a book. So yeah, capturing yep. real life is a good thing. Yep, I tend to agree with her 100%. <laughs> All right, let's go back to childhood. What was your mm -hmm. favourite book as a child? Um, it was more a series. So it was The Babysitter's Club um, by Anne M. Martin. So I'm sure a lot of people would be familiar with those books they were very popular in the 1980s mm -hmm. so I think sort of being a, a pre-teenager myself I think I can relate to the stories of you know um, teenage girl gossip and you know who they liked at the time and right, secrets yeah. you know yeah. so I it was a real escape for me I think as a child and um, and, and I love to write myself so I got lots of inspiration from those books when I started writing short stories as a child so yeah, definitely the Babysitters Club, and I've still got the whole collection now, oh, so fantastic. which is pretty special. Yeah, yeah, yeah it might be uh, worth some money. It could be, and look, and I've got two stepsons, so they're unfortunately ah. not interested <laughs> in reading it. So I don't have anyone to hand them down to, which is oh, a bit of a shame. Oh, there you go. All right. So, do you write for a particular audience? Look, um, I tend not to like the word chiclet. I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of negative, you know attitude towards mm -hmm. that word mm -hmm. so my books are definitely aimed at women they're definitely um, aimed at the female market however recently I got my very first five-star review from a male reader wow fantastic. which was really exciting yeah. yeah so I think I think men can relate as well and I think it might give men an insight into helping them understand women and and the issues that we face so it was really nice to get a review from a male reader yeah and look I feel like you're an having only read one of your books, I can't speak for the others, but certainly mm -hmm. in Making March, it feels like, you know, we were in your brain and we could have just sat down, had a cup of tea, and this was just everything that was spilling out. You were just, it was almost like a, almost like a stream of consciousness sometimes, I guess, in that it was, you could 
just see your mind leaping from thing to thing as your day just went on or dissolved into an absolute you know disaster absolutely and I think I think it's funny that all women can relate to her first world problems (laughs) and how it was a total disaster but it was just the fact that she nicked herself shaving in the shower and it was like a scene from Psycho so (laughs) just those simple things that women face you know every day yeah absolutely obviously lots of Australian things about your books and you know being on Australian book lovers so tell us a little bit about why based in Australia um, I think I'm a great believer in, in write about what you know. Mm-hmm. So obviously, and being a writer of humour, I think that, you know, Australians have an absolutely outrageous sense of humour and I wanted to share that with the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, and we don't take ourselves too seriously either. So I think that's um, that's the great thing about the Australian humour. So that's why I wanted it to be very Australian. There's lots of Australian slang in my books as well. Yes. So um, I often joke that I should have a glossary of terms <laughs> in the back. <laughs> It might be a really good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I've I've got a lovely um friend in Scotland who I met on Twitter just because she's a fan of my books, and we actually talk quite often, which is lovely. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, she messaged me when she was reading the book, and she said, "Look, I have to ask, what's a bogan?" You know, um, <laughs> you know, and, and the the character was going to the servo and the arvo, and I had no idea what you were talking about, so I had to Google it. <laughs> So, you know, we definitely have a language all of our own, I think, yes, for sure. we do. We absolutely do. Have you done much travelling outside of Australia or are you, you feel like that, you know, you know your backyard and that's what it is? Because you're from Sydney, is that right? I am, yeah. So I live yeah. in uh, Greater Western Sydney at the base of the Blue Mountains. Ah, so that's where I'm from. Sydney. Yeah. Yeah, and I actually grew up in, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Cronulla, the Sutherland Shire. Heard of it, so yeah. I, yeah, so I grew up. Um, by the water and now I live out in the far west so it's been a big change. Tree I have change? travelled. Uh, sorry? A tree change is it? To go yeah a tree that change yeah. that's right yeah. definitely but I have travelled I've been um, I've been to the US I've been around the Caribbean uh-huh. um, the South Pacific New Zealand and parts of the US so yeah so I'd like to travel a lot more. Uh, yes post-COVID I think we all would like to oh, uh, get absolutely spread ourselves around a little bit more. Yeah. But the positive has been we've had more time to read and more time to write. So it's not a bad thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So did you get lots of writing done during the lockdowns? No, because I'm actually an essential worker. So I'm a nurse. Ah, So unfortunately, I didn't get um, as much time as I would like. Mm. So we were quite busy, as you can imagine. What field of nursing are you still in? I'm an aged care clinical nurse consultant in an emergency department. Ah, very good. Yeah. Still working at health myself, but this is all about books. So let's go back to books. Although I think nurses have, as you say, a sense of humor, but they also Absolutely. have a great insight into, I think sometimes the vulnerability of humans and being able to help people over those vulnerable times is a great skill that so many nurses have. Absolutely. And I've drawn so much inspiration from my job, the stories that I hear, because I look after older people, they have wonderful stories yeah. um, and wonderful life experiences. So the two books I'm writing at the moment were actually inspired by patient stories, so which is yeah. lovely. Well, look, tell us a little bit about those. So the one I'm going to soon publish is a novella called Not Dead Yet. Mm-hmm. So it's a story about 71-year-old Mary. So I chose a lady um, of that age because I feel like older people, especially women, feel invisible in society and I wanted to tell a story of an older woman and the issues that they face. So it's, it's obviously lighthearted and a bit of a laugh because it wouldn't be a Hayley Walsh book if it wasn't <laughs> funny. <laughs> but it basically tells the story of Mary who lost her husband of 51 years and 12 months after his death she decides to up and move to a retirement village. So she sells up in Sydney and moves to Queensland. Mm. So it's about you know all the all the I suppose I'm not swearing, but, you know, all the bitchy women in the retirement village and, and how she adjusts to that um, mm-hmm. that different life because she's not what you'd call a people person. So it's mm-hmm. a big adjustment for Mary. So it's the laughs along the way of adjusting to her new life up in Queensland. So that's one of the stories. Uh, and the other one I'm working on is a novel called Scattered Scones. So it's about a 52-year-old lady who receives quite a devastating diagnosis and has an estranged daughter back in Sydney and she's Mm -hmm. moved to Adelaide to start a bakery five years later. So she goes on a crazy road trip with her best friend to try and um, reconnect with her estranged daughter. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the people and the characters she meets along the way who will eventually help her accept her diagnosis and um, and get on with life. So again, it's lighthearted, but looks at some serious issues. 
sounds fantastic. So when when can we expect those out? Have you got particular goals for them? I have. I'm hoping to publish um, Not Dead Yet around September, October this mm-hmm. year. And I'm hoping I'm going to try and query Scattered Scones again for about six months when the manuscript yep. is complete. Um, and obviously, if no success, I will, I'll get it out there and self-publish sometime next year. Okay. So who would be the houses, I guess, that you would look to query so in in traditional publishing would you go for the big four or are there particular small publishers you know like small publishing houses that do your kind Um, of light-hearted fiction well i guess i would be querying agents before Mm -hmm. i look at publishing houses so i do have a very long list because i I did query making march for about eight months before i self-published so i do know the the agents i'm going to query and i'll try again so yeah and obviously, you know, you do a lot of research about what they're looking for. And I've got a very yes. long list. So I will well, we'll start that process sometime next year. It, it is long and laborious, isn't it? Because it's not Absolutely. consistent. Each group does different books, likes their submissions differently. And it's, you have to be pretty flexible to get all of that done and keep, I'd imagine, many spreadsheets with tick lists and Absolutely. instructions. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but one thing I would tell authors is, you know, don't let the fact that you're getting rejected um, put you off getting your work out there. Because I yeah. feel a lot of people think, oh, I'm not good enough, you know. But if you just get your work out there and find your audience, um, the traditional publishing is not, you know, the be all and end all. So I think that's what I would tell a lot of people who are starting out. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's good advice. They, some of the statistics that we looked at on uh, Australian book lovers is that there's like 23,000 books published in Australia every year and mm. the big four or sort of the imprints of them really only publish a few hundred almost between them and then their small presses take a chunk and then self-publishing so it's not just a single route to getting your your work out there. Absolutely and, and we're lucky in this day and age that we have so many you know, ways that we can get our work out there. You know, yeah. 30 years ago, we didn't have the internet. So I think we're very lucky. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I showed my age when I remember when the internet first started. So let's move on about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, okay. I, I look, I'm, I've got to dye my grey hairs at the moment, which is, you know, one of those things that she talks about in Making March. So I can Yes, relate. yes. Oh, no, I've given up dyeing mine. I think, yeah, whatever. I was wasting all my money. Tell me then about when you switched to self-publishing for mm. Making March, what was the decision behind that? Uh, just basically wanting to get my work out there, you know, all those, all that blood, sweat and tears that you've put into a book over three or four years. Yeah. And I'd have to say that the, the writing community on Twitter, if it mm. wasn't for them, Veronica, I would have never have got my book out there. Ah, I have learned so much and it is the most supportive community I've ever come across. They're it's amazing, aren't they? Wonderful. Absolutely. It's just not competitive. It just blows me away how generous people are with their time and their information. And, you know, you'll get people who are a little bit successful who'll jump on and say, this is what happens to me. And I, they do a whole thread about what they've learned and what not to do and what to do. And uh, agents, you know, pitch fests, everything. Absolutely. And just reading other authors' blogs um, yeah. and, and mistakes that they made and advice that they would give someone starting out. I've just learned so much. Mm. And if it wasn't for the support of fellow self-published authors, I never would have got my book out there. So I'll be forever grateful. They've been wonderful. Biggest lesson that you learned in self-publishing, what would that be? Do not attempt to format a paperback on your own. Invest <laughs> some money because it is very hard. <laughs> Excellent advice, Hayley. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> so, look, you know, formatting the new book is, you know, I could get my head around that. Yes. Um, and obviously, and pay for an editor. Definitely pay for a good editor. They're, they're yeah. worth their weight in gold. So Absolutely that would, priceless, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Yes. But I will never attempt ever again to format a paperback. Very difficult. Very difficult. No. All right. You heard it first from Hayley Walsh. Hayley, tell us about marketing your book. What yeah, do you find I- most useful? That's an interesting question because I, I feel like sometimes as a self-published author, you market and you market and you promote and you promote and you feel like it's going off into the void, to yes. be honest. So yeah. it is very hard. And I think you just need to get yourself out there any way you can um, support other authors, you know, um, by having them on your blog, interview other authors, host guest posts by other authors, approach other authors about, you know, maybe putting a guest post on their blog. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about networking more than anything. And I found that that's been quite successful for me. Mm. 
Mm. Definitely networking. Yeah. As you say, the connections really, it's, and it's a long-term prospect. It's not, here's my book and, you know, you hammer it at people for the next six months. This is get to know people. This is, as you've said, a little bit of back and forth and supporting each other and offering a hand up and, yeah, lots of community. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And, and it's hard work. I mean, it's, it's ongoing. As, as you said, you know, you can't publish a book and think it's going to get into the hands of your audience. You need to constantly be promoting that any way you can. Yeah. Tell me about your blog. Why did you start a blog? You know, I started the blog, uh, one, to, to network, yep. uh, two, to help launch my website when I launched my website just over 18 months ago, and, and to get to know other authors and mainly to support others. Yeah. So I just wanted to be supportive of other people and help them get their work out there as well. Um, and and any, any excuse to write, really. So it was yeah. another avenue to write. So I enjoy uh-huh. blogging. You think up different questions for each of your authors because I've had a little bit yeah. of a read of some of those. So what is your research like? Uh, look, sometimes I've actually, I've, I've actually read their work. So mm-hmm. I, I know their work. I've read their books. So I can ask them specific questions. Um, I do my research. Yeah, so I basically just, you know, it's it could be a certain genre that they write. So I ask questions about that genre or yep. why they chose that genre, what their inspiration is. So yeah, I just I get to know the person a little bit before I interview them. I think so. That's that's how I come up with different questions and make them individual to the person that I'm interviewing. So important. Absolutely. Like me, I've been stalking you on social media to find out all about you before we speak tonight. So that's a good oh, thing. Oh, thank God I haven't done anything too embarrassing. <laughs> Well, not that I could see. (laughs) All right. So uh, tell me, you you mentioned that you'd received a five-star review from a mail reader and that was pretty good. So what's the best response you've ever had to your writing? I think I I told you this when I answered some of the questions before the interview. Um, I actually, yeah, look, I I might cry when I tell you this story because it's so beautiful. So um, I... You know how local coffee shops have those little book exchanges, the free book exchange, take yes. a book, leave a book. Yes. So my local coffee shop up the road has one of those. So I thought I'll leave a copy of Making March and Crayons and Chaos there for someone to pick up and hopefully enjoy. Mm-hmm. And I think it was about two weeks later, I got an email through my author website from a lovely local, an older lady in her 60s called Heather, who was surprised when she read my books to read the bio on the back and realise I was a local and I was Australian. Mm-hmm. So she contacted me through the website and told me that she, since she'd lost her husband, she'd been terribly, terribly depressed and um, in a bad place. And when she read my book, she said, I hadn't laughed that much in ages and you just, you know, you made me smile for the first time in a long time. That's so beautiful. It, it was. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I actually met her for coffee and we're great friends and we catch up regularly. That's fantastic. Uh, and it's a beautiful story, yeah. And it just means the world to me that I actually made her laugh in quite a dark time in her life. So... I think as an author, you can't ask for for more than that. It was just wonderful. Absolutely not. I've got on my mouse pad, I've got write it so that people can hear it and it slides through the brain and goes straight to the heart. And oh, that absolutely. Sounds, that's from Mayor and Angelou and it sounds as though that is exactly what happened to your friend, Heather. That is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And look, not only have I gained a fan of my work, but I've gained a friend, you know, which oh. is just lovely. Yeah. I know, so, it just makes you want to cry, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. I feel oh, I'm feeling more warm and lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what books do you like to read? Um, I obviously am, am a big fan of, look, look, I'll tell you, my favourite book of all time is Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen Fielding. <laughs> okay, yeah. And after reading Making March, I can you can probably see that was the inspiration behind writing first person in diary form. Yes, beautiful. Yeah, so I love right. I, lo- I love reading obviously humorous women's fiction. Um, I like reading true crime stories, and I'm a lover of a good thriller with a good mm. twist that you don't see coming. So I do like a good thriller as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one day I'd like to try my hand at thriller, but we'll see how we go. So I'd like to write one one day. That's that's my goal. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So be something totally different. And what's on your table at the moment? What's the latest book that you've read? I'm actually reading Comrades, Concubines and um, Lovers by Graham, who's a self-published, Graham Hunter, Mm -hmm. who's a self-published author who gave me the good review. Ah, very good. Yeah, so I've picked up his book and I'm reading that at the moment. So it's um, actually a 
it's his real life experience of traveling overseas in the 80s mm -hmm. um you know Trey, he went to russia asia for work and the women that he met and the relationships he formed and you know trying to get a, a girlfriend out of behind the iron curtain in russia mm -hmm. and so he wrote about his experience so i've almost finished that and mm -hmm. i highly recommend it um that people read graham's book it's fantastic i'm really enjoying it ah, okay thank you tell me any audio books in your future I would love to do that, but I'll be honest with you, I don't know where to start. So that would be a big learning curve for me. I would love to do that. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more difficult in Australia. I've been investigating a little bit myself and, it, of course, you can't do it on um, the American side. Uh, right. You, or, what is it? Audible? You can't upload yeah, it Audible. Audible That's here. Right. So, mm. uh, but you can do it through Find A Way Voices. So mm. watch this channel. I'm trying to uh, have a look. I've actually done some recording myself with my fabulous new podcast mic but we'll see how that goes um wow. i might sound a little bit too uh like myself which might put people off so if you had your choice of who you would like to read your book as an audio book who would that be i do like tony collette she's one of my favorite australian actors Fantastic. um but there's also a couple of you know comedians as well like maybe Rebel Wilson or, or something oh, like that you know yes. for making March I think she would be perfect yes. so oh, she'd be a classic absolutely yeah so mm. maybe an Australian comedian I think would yeah. definitely be be the pick mm. if, it, if I couldn't get Tony Collette they would be my second choice fair enough <laughs> <laughs> you always have to have a plan B you oh have yes to have a plan this, B. this is all very good now is there any truth to the rumor that you are the wicked stepmother or are you in fact a fabulous <laughs> stepmother to your two stepsons of course i'm a fabulous stepmother absolutely <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't want to come to the microphone and and uh, and say no refute that <laughs> no look if they were here you would hear nothing but fighting in the background so i'm here all by myself apart from the puppies tonight so we're all good <laughs> <laughs> very good very good yeah no cra look crayons and chaos was um, that came about because I'd finished making March and it was sitting with my editor yep. and I was looking for a new project. And I said to a work colleague, look, I just, you know, I don't know what to write. I really need mm -hmm. a new project. Mm -hmm. And we're having coffee and she looked at me and she went, are you serious? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you left, you know, you walked away from a bad marriage. You met a wonderful man with two kids. You have no children of your own and you became an instant stepmom. She said, I'm sure there's, you know, an idea for a good story there. And I sat there and I thought about it and I thought, yeah, that would be hilarious. And it, yes. I think I wrote the manuscript in, it was only a novella, but I wrote it in about six months. Fantastic. And it was easy to write because it was it was true life, yeah. you know. So, yeah. yeah, Crayons and Chaos is good fun. Yeah, it's, it's all um just about adjusting to these, you know, two miniature terrorists, as she likes to call them, <laughs> who have hijacked her life. <laughs> so there's some, there's some funny stories in that as well. Uh, yeah, it's good fun. Good. How do you squeeze writing in with work and with children and partners and dogs where does writing go <laughs> look i i have no set schedule i just fit it in when i can yep i have notepads in my glove box on my desk at work by the toilet in case i get an idea at three o'clock in the morning because you know when you need to go to the toilet and you go oh, i'll write that down um yeah so basically i just scribble things I'm really old school too, Veronica. I like to um, write in a notepad and then type it up. So I've got scribble everywhere. Yep. It probably makes sense to nobody else, but it completely makes sense to me. And I eventually put it together and we have a book. So yeah, whenever and wherever I can, basically, I fit it in. Sounds good. Why do you think the handwriting works for you? I feel, I just feel the words flow better for me with pen and paper. Mm -hmm. I've always been that way. If I sit in front of a screen, it, I sort of, I draw a blank, but if I've got a pen and paper, it flows. I, yeah. I couldn't tell you why. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's quite common though. Like a lot of people look, say that. Absolutely. It's, and look, it's interesting when I was doing clinical nursing, I always had to write hand over on a piece of paper, which I then shove in my pocket, never look at yeah. again. But if I didn't write it down, I would forget somebody's obs or medications or dressings or whatever. So it was, yeah, just something about the eye, the hand, the words coming yes. out on paper that, yeah, maybe something in the physiology. Who knows? Hopefully yeah. one of our listeners might let us know. That, that'd be great. <laughs> it would be helpful. When do you think, or do you think there'll come a time when you can, or when you will give up nursing and write full time? I dream about that every day. <laughs> <laughs> and every early shift, you're going to tell me every time the alarm goes off at, at some stupid o'clock? 
<laughs> at six o'clock every morning. Yeah. No, look, um, I actually, I love what I do, but I, yeah. if I had my time over again, I would definitely do something to do with writing, mm. you know, an editor, English teacher, because I've always loved words. So mm. I, I feel if I had my time over again, as much as I do love my nursing career, I would definitely do something different. Yeah. Yeah. It's Absolutely. It? Yeah. And I think when you've, get to a certain age where you can see some of those cycles of your own learning and working come around again. You think, ah, yeah, I've done this before. <laughs> Maybe I need yeah. to do something different. Yeah. yeah. But never too late. So when did you start writing? I've written ever since I was a kid. Like I write poetry and short stories. I was always yeah. scribbling down some sort of story. Mm. Um, but it was 2013. Um, unfortunately, I lost my father quite suddenly when oh. he was only 67. Sorry to um, hear that. Yeah, like it is what it is. He died in his sleep. And I think that sort of inspired me to think I've got to get this book written, Life is Too Short. Yeah. So that's when I started writing Making March. Mm. So I've got my dad to thank for that in a funny way that he inspired me to one, finally publish a book and to walk away from an, an, an unhappy marriage and I'm very happy now. So I think, um, you know, a sudden death in the family can have that positive impact on you in a way. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's the, you know, it, it speaks well to who you are, Hayley, that you could see that lesson and you could, you know, had the courage to sort of jump in and take that action. So yeah, good on yeah. you. Yeah. And, and my elderly patients too, quite often, you know, tell me their regrets and, and say to me, you know, life is so short, do, do what makes you happy. So I hear their voices in my head as well. And I think mm. they've inspired me as well. The people that I look after. Yeah. Yeah older people have such wisdom and if we just take the time to listen it, it's brilliant i still do a lot of work in aged care and i'm just amazed at at the lives people have lived there was a great book that i read by bronnie weir called the five regrets of the dying i don't know if you've read that one but that was that was just amazing oh, i have heard of that book i'll yeah. definitely have to read that yeah, yeah it sounds it, amazing it is lovely and one of them was you know don't live with regret just get out and do that kind of thing so uh yeah What's next for you? You've got two books. Oh, we've got a novella and a novel. Yes. Are they this year? Will you get those out, do you think? Um, I'm definitely hoping to get Not Dead Yet out and Scattered Scones published next year. Mm -hmm. But you know what it's you know what the brain of a writer is like. There's always new ideas that pop into your head. <laughs> we are so. shockers for the shiny object syndrome, are we not? I know. And it's so <laughs> and you feel like you're betraying that manuscript because you start yeah. something else and you think, oh yes. my goodness. But I've got another idea I've just started um, mm -hmm. called Tis Not the Season to be Molly. Right. So it's about how women, you know, if Christmas wouldn't happen if it wasn't for mum <laughs> <laughs> or women in general. So, yeah. Yeah. again, it's, it's written in first person, but it's not in diary form. So I'm trying to challenge myself. So my other two books I'm writing, I'm doing in third person past mm -hmm. tense. So mm -hmm. I like to challenge myself and, and write in different point of views, and I think that helps you grow as a writer oh, yeah, yeah. so I'm really enjoying that experience of writing in third person and being able to show the reader rather than tell so it's been a wonderful experience a big learning curve ah, very good do hmm. you go to any courses or are you primarily self-taught with your writing uh, I think I'm self-taught yeah I just, <laughs> I just wing it no yeah. yeah no I haven't done any creative writing courses or mm -hmm anything like that but I do belong to a local writing group and I think yep. um I've learned a lot from you know the fellow writers that come to that group as well so oh, yeah just good. just I'm a very practical learn as you go type of person so yeah I think that's yeah that's how the, my books come together in the end yeah I'm, I'm a huge panster I don't plot yeah, yes. at all yes <laughs> <laughs> but somehow it comes together I don't know how but it does so yeah yeah and produces a, a fabulous work so whatever it is don't break it it's it's looking good Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's nice to know we're doing something right. Yes, absolutely. Tell me, what advice would you give for aspiring authors? Definitely, again, write what you know. I think if you write something that you know, it's it's helpful. Yeah. And and basically just, you know, don't give up. Follow your dreams. You know, if you've got a story there, don't be afraid to get it down. Don't think you're not good enough. Just get it get it out there. Just be brave enough to get it out there. Mm, yeah, don't doubt yourself, I think, would be the, the best advice I could give. Yeah. And what about readers? Why should readers pick up one of your books? Well, just frankly, to have a good laugh. <laughs> yes. And we could yeah. all do with a really good laugh. I realized when I was doing my research again, you know, for your um, session tonight, just, you know, brushing up on what I'd already collected. 
because I've been reading a few dystopian books, which, you know, I love sci-fi and fantasy, but oh, okay. it's, uh, it's been a little bit heavy. There's been a lot of death and dying and violence and yes. wrecking the world. And I thought, oh, my God, thank goodness I'm going to talk to Hayley. She's going to cheer me up. <laughs> Look, I, I think, you know, because obviously you're know, having read Making March, it's just, you know, like she talks about, you know, waking up with her period and then she's got a cold so she feels like crap, you know, yeah. or, yes. um you know, she can't lose weight or disastrous dates with men or, you know, being afraid to have sex with the light on because of the wobbly bits. And, you know, I think yep. all women can just relate to yeah. just the everyday shenanigans that, go, yeah. that goes on. So, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely honest. And, you know, it's, it's fantastic. It's just so easy. And you feel like people have kind of peeled back your, your layers a little bit. And that's, that's a, that's beautiful. Yeah, look, I'm a very down to earth, you know, relatable person. So I was hoping that, you know, I wanted to build a character that was, um, look, Kate can be a little bit negative, the main character, but I intended her to be that way, you know, that she just, everything's a drama and first world problems. So I, I think I've hit the nail on the head with, you know, that type of character. So I'm hoping she's very relatable. Is she going to get a sequel? Mm, I haven't. No, I have no plans to do a sequel at this stage, but I'm thinking about a sequel to Crowns and Chaos. So right. that's in the back of my head. Yes. So maybe, um, you know, 20 years down the, the track when they're retired and, you know, the two stepsons come, they they go back to work and then they need to look after their grandchildren or something. Ah. So I'm thinking about a, a sequel to Crowns and Chaos. So that's, nice. yeah, it's been in the back of my head for a while. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. Very good. Tell me, do you do any research, given that you're such a pantser? and the stories just kind of pour out. Do you then have to go back and do some research or is it pretty much just drops onto the page as is? Look, it's interesting you should ask me that because with Not Dead Yet, there are flashbacks to Australia in the 1960s ah, when she's growing up. So I, yes. have, uh, I have a newfound appreciation for authors of historical fiction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because I, yeah, because I had to Google things like, you know, when when was the Golden Gate time invented, you know, because oh. I didn't want to talk about it if it didn't exist in 1968. So, uh. yeah, so that's been an experience, you know, having first book I've actually had to research back in time. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been an interesting experience. If you don't get it right, of course, people will be up in arms and, that's right. you know, they'll say the Golden Gate time was not around at that time that's right i remember eating them in the 70s but were they around in the 60s 71 they came 71. to australia <laughs> there so you i can go. tell you <laughs> so thank oh, you there you go now everybody in australia knows the golden gay time was invented in 1971 excellent very good you never know you. it could come up in pub trivia you never well, know that's it those are important things to know yes now we we are great at trivia at our place very good okay a little bit about your book covers. I love your yes. book covers. They're kind of as clean and bright and cheery as the, the words inside. So where were the inspiration behind your covers? That's a good question. I, look, I, I design my own covers on Canva. Mm -hmm. So I have a Canva subscription. Um, I do them myself um, and I just enjoy the creative process. I just, yeah, I think with Making March, you know, on the cover there's you know, a glass of wine and I think there's a, I think a knife and a fork, you know, she's on a diet there's a broken heart and a bouquet of wedding flowers yes. so yes. just a mishmash of bits of the story and um and it's bright and happy so and I really enjoy that you know putting putting together the the covers I, I find that quite fun and I my my covers are very cartoon like as well so not dead yet is very sort of that cartoon type cover mm -hmm. which I think goes with the fun light-hearted story so they're always colorful and cartoony and fun yeah. so I think it, it tells Gee. you it's going to be a fun book that's good there's one book we haven't spoken about, and that is Write mm. That Book. So tell us a little bit about that. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, isn't that terrible? I completely forgot about that. <laughs> Poor little so that was orphan little... on its own. <laughs> <laughs> so that was another little project that I was um, doing while Making March was being edited. Yeah. And it was basically, you know, a lot of other self-published authors asking me questions, you know, about how did you come up with your characters? How do you come up with your storyline? Are you a pantser? Are you a plotter? So I thought to myself, I'll write a little book, you know, to help others. So it's very easy to read. You know, it goes through the idea for a story right through to if you want to query it. So it'll give you that, you know, if you want to write a book but you don't know where to start, it, it gives them the ideas to actually start getting that idea on paper. And it's it's very lighthearted. Again, it's very Australian. It's, you know, my sense of humour comes through. Mm -hmm. um, and the two reviews I've got for it so far have said they just felt like they were talking to an old friend and having a laugh over a coffee yeah. and learning at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, just very easygoing sort of 
laugh of a book that actually teaches you something. So, yeah, Best so that was a fun book to write. Yeah, very good. So I publish that one as well? It is, absolutely. Beautiful. Okay, yep. so where can people find your books? Uh, so they're basically on Amazon. Mm-hmm. And they're obviously, they're available on Kindle Unlimited too, if you have the Kindle Unlimited subscription. Yep. I obviously have a link to where you can buy my books on my author website. Mm-hmm. And at the moment, they're just published on Amazon. So I don't know if I'll branch out to other avenues um, in the future, but at the moment, they're just published on Amazon. Do you use Amazon advertising? Have you taken that step? I have. I have. I've done a few ads on Amazon and I've had some more subscribers to my blog through advertising on Facebook. So that's been quite successful. Nice. nice. Yeah, so just it's been good. Slowly building the, the following. Yeah. And it's all a learning curve, you know, like Facebook ads and, and things. It's a bit of trial and error, but once you get used to it, they can be quite beneficial. Definitely. Where can people find you online? Obviously I have a Twitter account. So yes. um, at Tales by Hales um, and it's, Tales with a Y and Hales with a Y. So I thought that was quite a clever play on words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at Tales by Hales. Um, obviously, my author website, which is just hayleywalshauthor.com. Um, and I also have a Facebook author page as well, which is at Tales by Hales as well on Facebook. All right. Any last words for our audience? Look, you know, if you need a good laugh <laughs> and, you know, you're having a bad day, definitely check out one of my books. I'm sure it'll make you giggle. Yes. Definitely. Absolutely. And I can absolutely vouch for that for making March. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we've been talking with Hayley Walsh, who is a light-heart, oh, a light-hearted author. Well, she's a light-hearted author, but she's the author, author of light-hearted fiction. So thanks, Hayley. Thank you so much. No worries. Bye for now. Bye. So that was our lovely Hayley Walsh, uh, mostly about making March and lots of giggles and really wish her luck both in her podcast and with the release of her new book, new book Not yes. Dead Yet. Thank you so much, Hayley. It was just awesome to uh, have you a part of the Australian Book Lovers podcast. And thanks for uh, all the giggles, <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> and for putting a smile on my face even while we're recording this, uh, yeah, while we're recording right now. Yes. So is it time for quotes, Darren? Well, I think it is, yes. And All right. Yes, and inspired by giggles and, and uh, the, the need to find, I, I guess, humour, but also happiness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, because at the end of the day, that's, I think, one of the things that uh, Haley's books will bring people, and that is a sense of happiness. Uh, so I thought, um, well, I guess my quotes are sur- surrounded a little bit about happiness, of mm-hmm. all things. So did you want to go first, or did you want... I oh, know, give us yours. Okay, I'll start with one. You start. I'll start with one from, of all people, Benjamin Franklin. Right. And his quote is, happiness consists more in conveniences of pleasure that occur every day than in great pieces of good fortune that happen but seldom. Yeah. So. Yeah. And absolutely, when you think about that and, you know, what we mentioned earlier, one of the tips to getting more laughter in your life is to laugh at little things. And that's absolutely right. You know, sometimes we think of those big momentous occasions, but yeah, just take it to the small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, if you you, you can make it a little bit of a mission every day to to just find something small throughout the day that brings a smile to your face and Mm. take a moment to to enjoy that it's there or enjoy what it is. Because we sometimes we just rush through the day. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, uh, I know I do anyway, speaking for myself, and you look back and there were so many opportunities to just, even it's 30 seconds, to enjoy a particular, something. You know, there's yeah. always something there to be found. Uh, but we, as, you know, when we're rushing, so we just miss it. We, I'd hate to think how many little moments of happiness that I've missed. Uh, but I sure as hell make sure I catch every, you know, doomsday and news article. <laughs> so <laughs> right. I, I got I to gotta flip that, that board around a little bit. Yes. <laughs> so. And stop yourself thinking about that. Now, I'm going to say that's one of the reasons I love my chickens. So currently I have uh, five ladies and one rooster and... Just watching them in the garden is hilarious. You know, the, the rooster, they're very good. They look out. Yes, they want to, you know, jump the ladies and that kind of thing. But once he's that he's funny, he tries not to pick on everybody. But watching him, if you throw out, they love sunflower seeds. So they come up to the back door and I'll give them some sunflower seeds, not too many. But then you, you give some to him, but he puts it down. He picks it up and he puts it down. He goes, boop, 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 
and he makes the girls come over and they race over, of course, and gobble a lot. But, you know, to see them fighting over a little bit of lettuce that I'll give them or, you know, any little bit or they you know, the dogs chasing them away from their bowls. They try and sneak a couple of biscuits and hmm. I'll see them running to the yard. Like if one of them's still up in the, the, um, the, the chook shed and I've, the others have come down and I'm giving them some seeds and you call chook, chook, chook. To see them running is hilarious. You know, I, I cannot but help smile at their big, fat, fluffy butts going boom, 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 as they race down. You know, they're just gorgeous. And then they look at your side eye because, of course, you know, they've got eyes on the, each side of the head and they look at you and you think, okay, and then they look the other way. And, yeah, I love my chickens. They do make well, me maybe smile. Maybe the, you'll have to uh, create a quote of your own, something to do with the elegance uh, the elegant moves of a uh, yeah, overweight <laughs> chicken, <laughs> something like over feathered chicken. Over feathered yeah. chickens, yeah, no, they they are gorgeous. And I've got two little um, Chinese silkies, so they've got the ones with the great hairdos, you know, like their their little feather uh, do on top of their head. So yeah, they're just as funny, just they're good. Anyway, back to the quotes. And this was a lovely quote by a woman called uh, Mary Lou Cook. Now, she was an actress that uh, died in 1944. She was uh, born in 1908, died in 1944. Um, so I couldn't say that I've ever seen her in anything. But this quote is, Creativity is inventing, experimenting, growing, taking risks, breaking rules, making mistakes and having fun. If yeah. only we could apply all of those and treat our life, you know, as, as a creative project. Yes. Can you imagine that? And, and it just was a kind of a, a poke for me to remember that, you know, creativity, as I said to you before we came to record, is that I'm, you know, just doing another big slice and dice on one of my uh, novels that I'm working on at the moment. And I was getting, oh, I won't say anxious, I was getting a bit cranky at myself trying to sort it out and, you know, this should be easier. And then I thought, ah. Oh, when I was looking at the quotes, I thought, yeah, I should be having fun. You know, the creativity yes. is not about making square pegs fit in round holes. It's about taking risks, breaking the rules, and maybe I shouldn't try and make it fit into this framework that I found. And it's hard, it is, I find it hard as a discovery writer or a pantser to follow the rules for what other people say is a rhythm of a story. And I can see that that kind of thing makes sense, but... Yeah. Anyway, that made a lot of sense to me. Thank you, Mary Lou Cook. Yeah, and maybe well inspired you to look for those um, conveniences of pleasure that can be found in doing while you're working on your creativity or creative project. Yes. So rather than go, oh my God, this editing's killing me. You know, <laughs> you know what? That sentence was really good. I'm yeah. so happy with that sentence. <laughs> the other three, not so happy, but the one. Not so happy. One yeah. was pretty good. Yeah. All right. Give us another one. Okay, so now I've actually got an old Chinese proverb, which right. I, I, re I really enjoyed when I read it. And it is, uh, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help someone else. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. That, that's good. Uh, yeah, I think I like that proverb. I would have to agree there is nothing more rewarding than knowing that something that you've done has made a difference in someone else's life or helped them change their life rather. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then again, you know, as far as Chinese proverbs go, if I, I could happily take that in that order because I'd, I'd, I'd love to, uh, I like a good nap. So let's start with a nap. Yep. And then instead of fishing, <laughs> I'll go surfing. Uh -huh. Then, yes, please, I'll inherit a fortune for uh -huh. a run a mark uh -huh. for a year. And then once that's all done, I'll help someone. And that way, yeah, get it, get all of that proverb happening. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, no, please I think, yep, pass some of that money over this way too. <laughs> Yeah, but helping someone, I, like, I think always helping someone is just sharing the joy of living, really, isn't it? Uh, because if you're motivated to help somebody, then you, you're never going to help somebody to be sad. You always, it's always going to be trying, it's going to have some sort of positive element to it. And uh, yeah, and that's a, that's a good thing. Yes. So, yeah. And then together you're making really groovy, positive energy, man. But you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it is it's, uh, you, because you're motivated to, yeah, enhance the energy around you. So, which I think is cool, which is, yeah, yeah help somebody. Yeah. So I had about a thousand other quotes and then I started looking up 25 funny quotes about reading because I thought oh, lighthearted reading and then I was, I was getting caught up on that. So I thought that I'd share this bookworm problem with you, which okay. is 
laughing out loud while reading a book in public place and getting funny looks from the other people. I thought, yeah, that is a bookworm problem. And if you're reading Haley's book on the bus or on the train, you may well find yourself laughing out loud and getting funny looks. Not only the funny looks, you might get a seat to yourself. <laughs> in, fact, if, in this day and age, you're almost guaranteed. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so that's good. So have a good enough go. laugh and you'll have uh, police ask waiting for you at the bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good problem to have, of course. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> And, you know, to be honest, I have seen some people have a quiet chuckle every now and then, you know, on my when I was commuting every day on a train. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have seen somebody have a bit of a laugh from reading books. So it does happen in the wild, absolutely. Very good. Yeah. A couple of happy little things to finish the episode yeah. with. Which means... Time for our tagline. Aha! Uh -huh. Indeed now, it does. Mm, how are we going to do this one? Um, do happiness or comedy? <laughs> mm, that's going to be a tricky one. You might, uh, you know, what if you just put some canned laughter after it? Maybe. Well, <laughs> then we'll, we'll deliver it like a joke then. Yes. <laughs> Without, no, it won't have much of a punchline. Uh, <laughs> so we'll try and deliver it as a joke. Don't ask me how. We'll just uh, wing it. That, that's, uh, that's how we do it. Well, okay. I'll, I'll lead you in and you do the punchline. So are you ready for it? Okay. Oh, wait on. Before we go, we've got to say to people, please, if you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to leave us some stars or a review on iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts, wherever you happen to be listening to us. And if you want to see what else we are up to, you can follow us on Twitter at Australian Books. And on Facebook and Instagram, we are at Australian Book Lovers because you get a few more letters to have your name on there. And of course, for all of the fabulous books that we've been talking about, have a look at www.australianbooklovers.com. And please uh, support our Australian artists and really enjoy everything that they are offering. And to finish up this lighthearted episode... Mm -hmm. I have to say, drum roll, please. Do, 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 do. What are we going to do, Darren? What are we going to remember? And then they said, read more Aussie books. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> don't give up the day, John. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I don't think we'd get any, uh, any uh, claps at the stand-up club, would we really? No, 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 no. I don't, I'm not thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking something will get, but collapse isn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you, everyone, for being part of episode 34. Thank you so much, Hayley Walsh, for making episode 34 such a special one. And yeah. to all our listeners, we can't wait to uh, be joining you again for the next episode. And until then, take care. Bye for now. Okay, so this is a chapter from Making March called Ding Dong Delivery. 16th of February, 2017, 9am. I was just about to make my morning coffee when the doorbell rang. Who the hell rings your doorbell at 7.30am? It was a courier driver delivering another new toy. I had completely forgotten that I had purchased it on a whim at the kitchen tea. The courier driver was very good looking. He was tall, buff and handsome with wavy dark hair and piercing blue eyes. I felt my face flush a little as it suddenly dawned on me what was inside that box. He gave me a cheeky little wink as I signed for it and he turned to walk back to his van. Yes, of course I checked out his backside, wouldn't you? I was very grateful that I was home to accept receipt of delivery as I avoided having to pick it up from the post office. The box had a rather large, colourful and glossy label that contained a picture of the product. It is a very realistic looking dildo. That would have been slightly embarrassing. I was just about to throw the box in the recycling bin when I noticed a brochure hiding right down the bottom. Curiosity got the better of me and I fished it out of the box. Well, let me tell you, I heated up my cup of coffee and sat down to have a look at what it had to offer and it was rather amusing. The brochure was advertising life-size male sex dolls. These latex lads look so realistic that it was quite frankly a little bit disturbing. You can buy all different coloured wigs in an array of hairstyles. You can opt for chest hair or a smooth torso. You can even buy carpet to match the curtains, if you know what I mean. There was the biggest catalogue of penis attachments I have ever seen in my life. You could order long and thin, short and thick, circumcised, uncircumcised, flaccid or erect. Well, I guess there's a market for everything. I guess every red-blooded woman has a preference when it comes to the shape and size of a man's penis. I personally prefer width over length myself. Let's face it, girls, what good is a nine-inch appendage if it's going to be like tossing a sausage down the hallway? 
Why is it that most women these days want their men to either wax or shave their chest? No, ladies, you've got it all wrong. I absolutely love a hairy chest. Men are supposed to be hairy. There is something extremely sex sex, sorry, sexy and primal about it. Nothing is better than running your fingers through all that manliness. I seem to be a very rare breed nowadays. I was born in the 70s after all. Maybe my mother gave birth to me on a shag pile rug. In fact, come to think of it, I can give you at least three reasons why dating a man with a hairy chest will always be a good thing. If your man has bare smooth pecs, you are missing out and here's why. Number one, he will keep you warm with his glorious patch of fluff. I call them luscious locks of love. You can snuggle up to it on a cold night. There is nothing like cuddling up to a warm woolly mammoth of a man. He's like a human electric blanket. Number two, in prehistoric times, being extremely hairy was considered to be the ultimate sign of masculinity. The hairiest man was probably the alpha of the tribe. That has not changed, ladies. And number three, being a man with a hairy chest changes, being with a man with a hairy chest changes a woman. I'm serious. It makes you want to do dirty things and you can grab onto him quite literally. What a ride. It's not only chest hair I find attractive. I love a bit of facial hair or a lot for that matter. What's not to like? Kissing a bearded man is more fun. It tickles in a nice way and that my friend is sexy. It also feels lovely when it brushes against your inner thighs if you venture south of the border. A beard makes a man look much older and more distinguished in my opinion. Women tend to be more attracted to older men and this has been proven throughout time and a bearded face screams, I am a man, a beastly man. Have you heard the term lumbersexual? It refers to being attracted to men who resemble a lumberjack. Yes, girls, it is a real thing. Who doesn't want a man who looks like he could build you both a fire and a house with his bare hands? There is no denying that is very attractive. Now, back to the product at hand. If an oversized, creepy looking doll with a realistic penis is your kind of thing, I suppose that could be okay. Look at it this way. It's got to be better than having your neighbours call the police to your door as they think they may have heard a loud gunshot as you leapt onto your blow-up doll and it popped. Oh well, I might go and check my dating profile. I swear, if this time turns out to be just another frustrating flop and waste of my time, I may just decide to spend the rest of my life with Bob, battery operated boyfriend. Let's meet again. Where magic happens. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.